Hello students, in the last lecture, we have seen two necessary and sufficient conditions for a subset to become a subgroup. In the first necessary and sufficient condition, which we stated in theorem 1, uh, since the associative property is inherited, we saw that it is enough to check closure property for H. Uh, identity has to be there in H and every element in H has to have an inverse in H. So if you are using theorem 1, you need to verify three conditions. But if you are using theorem 2, then you need to verify only two conditions. One is identity has to lie inside H and this condition has to be satisfied. That means for any two elements of H, this combination, first element into inverse of the second, should again lie inside H. This property is like a combination of closure property and inverse property. So naturally, uh, the question would be, which would be a better property to use? Should I use necessary and sufficient condition given in theorem 1? Or should I use the necessary and sufficient condition given in theorem 2? I would say, I mean as common sense dictates, since theorem 2 involves checking only two conditions, then you go ahead and use theorem 2 as a first option. But sometimes uh, you may... Uh, come across a dead end with theorem 2. We will see in some of the examples uh, that if you use theorem 2, it becomes a little bit more difficult to verify that something is a subgroup. In that case, you can always try theorem 1. Also, uh, look at theorem 2 again. What does theorem 2 say? Uh, apart from showing that the set is non-empty by showing that the most important element namely identity lies inside edge. Remember what condition has to be satisfied for all elements in edge. A into B inverse should also lie inside edge. What I really mean by this is A star inverse of B must lie inside edge. So that also, by the way, tells you how to compute this element. In order to compute this element, you must first take inverse of B and then combination of that with A. Now, for a specific example, if I have a group whose operation is denoted additively. So if for a specific example, the binary operation is addition, then what would this condition look like? Uh, for suppose H is a subset of G, H is non-empty, then by theorem 2, H will become a subgroup of G if and only if A star inverse of B lies inside H. But as I said specifically in an example, if the group operation is addition, then the star would be plus and inverse of B, this must lie inside H. But remember, if the group operation is addition, a better notation for the inverse would be minus b and therefore, I come up, come up with this condition. So specifically in an example, if my group operation is addition, then a non-empty subset of G will become a subgroup of G if and only if this condition is satisfied. And now uh, look at the example that I gave you in lecture 2 where I had taken the set of complex numbers with respect to addition and I gave you six subsets of this and I asked you to verify whether they are subgroups. Now it will be easier if you go back to this exercise and use this necessary and sufficient condition there and check individually which of them become subgroups. So just to give you an example, in fact I'll, I'll take an important example. Let us prove that for every natural number n, nz 
with respect to addition is a subgroup of the set of integers with respect to addition and uh, I have no doubt proved it in an earlier chapter that this is a group on its own, this is a group on its own and I know this is a subset of this so this is definitely a subgroup but I don't want to use that anymore. I want to illustrate this, this result. So remember the group operation in this case is addition. So because the group operation is addition, the necessary and sufficient condition of theorem 2 looks like this. So this is what I'm going to verify. But before you verify any condition, make sure that the most important element, that is the identity element, belongs to the given set. So that will be my first step. But let's look at the definition of NZ. NZ by definition has to contain all multiples of n, all integral multiples of n. So nz will, elements in nz will look like n times some integer. Now look at identity for addition. Identity for addition is 0. I know that. And the only thing I really need to do is check whether it belongs to this set. Well, I can always write 0 as n times 0. So it looks like a multiple of n. And therefore, 0 belongs to nz. Please check this as your very first property before you proceed with the necessary and sufficient condition. Always make sure that the identity lies in the given set. Now because it is uh, the operation is of addition, my necessary and sufficient condition will look like this. So take any two elements, arbitrary elements in the given set. My job is to prove that A minus B lies inside the same set. But for the moment, let me see what else I can imply from here. Because A lies in NZ, A has to be some multiple of N. Similarly, B has to be some other multiple of N. So B will look like n times y for some y belonging to z. And now consider a minus b. a minus b looks like n times x minus n times y which is n times x minus y. And notice that this is a multiple of n. It is n times some integer. So this element a minus b once again lies inside nz and therefore nz is a subgroup of z and this works for every natural number n and therefore uh, we have got plenty of examples of subgroups of z. Uh, we know that 2z is a subgroup of z, 3z is a subgroup of z and so on. An interesting question here to ask would be are these the only subgroups of Z or are there subgroups of Z which look different from NZ? Well, ponder about that. Think about it. You may not be able to come up with an answer immediately, but we are going to answer this question in the next few lectures. So let's look at the problem. G is given to be an abelian group. So it's a group in which commutative property is satisfied and H is given to be a subset of G for which this condition is satisfied. So any element of H will satisfy the condition that its square is identity. So an element will lie in H provided its square is equal to E. We have to prove that H will become a subgroup of G. So let us use Theorem 1, uh, you can try using Theorem 2 and see why it is a little more difficult. It's still possible but uh, you'll have to probably end up doing a little more work. So I think Theorem 1 is better here and uh, let's begin with, uh, firstly it is clear that H is a subset of G because I'm only picking elements from G. So clearly H is a subset of G. Let me immediately verify 
whether identity lies inside edge this should always be your first step because if identity does not lie inside edge the story ends over there you need not proceed that set will never become a group so let's look at identity identity is there in g and in order to lie inside edge it must satisfy this condition that square has to be equal to e but if you look at e square e square is e times e which will be equal to e so definitely identity satisfies this equation and therefore identity lies inside edge so that takes care of the identity property let us now go for the closure property so for the closure property i begin with two arbitrary elements of edge but if x lies inside edge its square will have to be equal to e and y is also inside edge so square of y will also have to be equal to e now remember i wish to prove that their product is again inside edge i wish to prove that closure property is satisfied so if i take any two elements of edge my aim is to prove that their product is again inside edge and product will lie inside edge provided it satisfies this condition so look at square of this element look at x y square x y square is x y times x y that's the meaning of square of an element by a square we mean a star a which we write as a into a or a a so square of an element means that element times itself now we have one very important piece of information in the problem and that is this group g is abelian commutator property is satisfied so i can use that commutator property and interchange the order of these two elements y into x can be written as x into y this is possible because the group is abelian and now this is x square this is y square but then x square is e y square is e so this will be equal to e so notice that for this element square is identity that means this element also satisfies this kind of an equation so i can say that x into y lies inside h which means closure property is satisfied in h now let us finally check the inverse property take any element in h that means x square is equal to e now you look at x inverse square x inverse square will be x inverse times x inverse which will actually work out to be you can actually use laws of indices or you can even use inverse of the product is product of the inverses in the reverse order but when laws of indices after a certain point get used to it that's the advantage of using this notation for the inverse you can freely use laws of indices but even if you don't want to do that in an earlier chapter we have proved that inverse of the product is product of the inverses taken in the reverse order here of course it doesn't make a difference because the two elements are equal and now this is x square inverse of this but x square is e so this will be e inverse and e inverse is e so for this element also the square is e that means this element lies inside h so all conditions are satisfied identity closure inverse all properties are satisfied by elements in h and therefore h will be a subgroup of g we will see some more examples of this type in the next lecture thank you